Okay, so just tonight, I'm just gonna cover real yeah. fast some of the stuff we already got covered on the first night. Just to, well, I know Rhonda wasn't here for that one, so I'm gonna cover some of that. Just to get to the point, I want to get to the some of the slides where I had to go to advance to show where some of the potential impact sites are from the um, the common impacts, the multiple common impacts into the ice sheet, or at least at least where we think they are. We haven't nothing definitive yet, but this is what we're looking at right now. Um, so, of course, it first starts off that, well, this is the current temperature record. Um, and it's more to put everyone's mind at ease. I know there are a lot of talk everywhere that we've never seen anything like this and the planet's warming and everything. But when they say the, the um, you know, we hit a new high of a record temperature. Uh, yeah, but the record temperature is only 140 years. Mm. So if we look back 10,000 years, if my computer didn't freeze up, it's not working. Of course it is. No, there we go. The way I know it'll get the link. So if we get back, it's the same one. Yeah. It's the same. Oh, okay, let's take it over. Okay. So really, what we're looking at is right here. So we're coming out of a little ice age. Uh, so this is taken from uh, the ice core samples that they've been pulling out of Greenland since the '90s, which goes back well. I think they've gone back at least fifty thousand years. They can go back into the temperature record. What they do is they compare uh, two oxygen isotopes, and oxygen isotope sixteen versus eighteen. So 99.99% of all the oxygen isotopes on the earth is oxygen 16, but there's always some portion of oxygen 18 in there in some ratio. And based on that ratio, they can tell what the temperature is. So that's how they were able to do this now. And so we can see that majority of the time in the past 10,000 years, it's been warmer than it is today. You see that actually there's a little bit deep, one to two degrees warmer during the medieval time period. It's called medieval warming and much warmer during Roman times and knowing and actually right here between eight to ten thousand years ago that is called or used to be called the climatic optimum meaning that was the optimum climate uh they're not allowed to call that anymore of course but that's what it was called for a while and so we saw roman warming actually using other proxies and uh, other anecdotal information based on roman records on how, the, how much their crop yields were and everything else like that they Figure that during the Roman times in the Mediterranean area, it was actually probably close to five degrees Celsius warmer than it is today. So then what we see actually here is once it goes cold, so we have warming, goes cold. And what happens is they have crop failures. Once you have crop failures, you have famine. Once you have famine, people's immune systems are going down. Then you get hit with a plague. And that's what we have here, just being in play kicks, and a third of the population gets wiped out. That's you in the pain. The little ice age we're in right now, how many years is that? About 500. So like you're saying, what they're talking about, the average highs right now is only going back about 140, 140 years. years. Yeah. So it's not even the planet. conspiracy theories that I am, the governments understand this trend. Trend, If you can get it, they probably have it. So which this global why, warming thing is not. Which is why they're constantly, like Justin Trudeau, blue boy, that's in light, like you know, times about three times around the earth. So all these ones that are saying, oh, you have to change the way you live, but we're going to keep doing what we do. So all so, these carbon taxes and all these. Right. Well, I mean, doing the, to the, fields and the, the issue around the world. Right. Really, See, it's, it's not people. It's well, humans. It's the narrative. The, nar the narrative is here's their narrative. It's CO2, right? Carbon dioxide, although they call it carbon footprint, carbon is element six. Carbon dioxide is one carbon atom with two oxygen. So, CO2 warming, I mean, CO2 in the atmosphere from anthropogenic means, meaning fossil fuel burning, which only started after World War II. We only started emitting enough carbon dioxide into the atmosphere to finance to cause global warming. So if that's the narrative, how do you explain the half degree of warming before World War II then? Mm -hmm. And then why for four decades after World War II, it got cold? 
and then Y has another one for the past 20 years. It's flat one. So that's what I'm saying is that not to say that this isn't true, it's just what is causing it is more of the question. It's, a, it's, it's happened repeatedly like cycles throughout millions of years. Right? right. Well, especially in the past two and a half million during the Pleistocene, we've seen the going between glacial and interglacial. And normally interglacial periods last anywhere from 10 to 15,000 years. So we're 11,600 years into our current interglacial. Now, does that mean we're going to go into, is that yeah. trend going to continue? Meaning we're going to go into another ice age within the next 4,000 years or sooner? We don't know. We don't but, know if the cycle's broken or if we're dead. dead. It's going to keep going. But if you look at your chart, it looks like there's a lot of heat before the ice age, the drops go down. Like. Yeah. I don't know how many years those are before we go and anywhere and actually, right now. In this period here, there's actually no evidence of implement of warfare. Once it goes cold, that's when we start seeing implement of warfare. So there, there is you know, some issues. Oh, here we have medieval warnings. This is another cathedral building that's going on in around Europe where they built approximately 800 cathedrals. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, all these artisans and craftsmen show up and they're able to build all these cathedrals. Gets cold. Once again, crop failures. Uh, the cathedral building stops immediately. Like it says, if they just didn't show up the next day. Crop failures, famine, plague hits. Then you have black plague. The same plague here, black plague hits here. One third of the year's population gets wiped out. So the, the baseline that the current narrative is pointing to saying we have to go back to pre industrial temperatures, that is the coldest. Half a millennium in the past 10,000 years. And if we go back to that, Canada is uninhabitable with a society as large as this because the growing season is much going to be much, much shorter. And actually, we have it. I saw in one of our stories that we first came up into this region early on when we first came across the continent. We came up here, we found it too cold for agriculture. So that's why we went back down to the Finger Lakes. So that's why we have to. And actually, I saw somewhere else too that. The term Adirondacks, that's actually a Mohawk word. I don't know how true that is, but it means bark eater. And it's basically the Adirondacks. Yeah. Mm. It's basically a derogatory name that we called the people that were living in this area that didn't do agriculture. So in the wintertime, they wouldn't have any food. So we call them bark eaters because that's what they would, they would have to eat. So that's what I'm saying. That's the quote. But we're not here, what we're looking at. Geez, we weren't nice, eh? <laughs> no. <laughs> Names for everyone. Here, the younger Well, This is the bowling alley lot 14,500 years ago. 12,900 years ago, something happened. Because if you can see, you ignore this part here, it's almost consistent line that was brought into the Holocene. So here, what we saw was right now they're they're worried about the two degree warming in a century. Um, what we saw there was an eight to 10 degree Celsius of cooling within one to five years. So the switch was instantaneous. It's like going to your house and turning on or turning, uh, turning on the air conditioning. Switch is instantaneous, but it takes a while to actually cool down the house and vice versa for the heat. So the stage in 300 drive for 1300 years, and then 11,600 years ago, something else happened. And we came out another eight to ten degree rise in temperature <laughs> within one to five years. So but that's eight, eight to ten isn't very hot. Eight to ten degrees globally. They're worried today of a two degree rise in a hundred years. What would a ten degree rise meaning? Say our average temperature here is zero degrees. Well, now it's minus ten. Okay. Yeah. So that's why you go back into full glaciation. At this point, basically, it's cold enough that the snow never melts. Coming, it will, comes like, spring. Like, like real fast. Yeah, yeah. coming spring in summertime, the snow doesn't melt. It stays there and you know, keeps accumulating, accumulating, and so it starts building the glacier. That's what's happened here. So we went into full, back into like full glaciation. And then again, 11,600 years ago, we came out of it, and we don't know what caused that. So you see, that's how. North America looked approximately during this time. So we had basically a two, two mile sheet of ice 
over almost all of Canada, most of the United, uh, northern United States as well. Uh, centered on Hudson's Bay. This is called the Laurentide Ice Sheet because it started, they believe, starting the Laurentians. That's where it first started accumulating and growing. Uh, that's the Cordelian Ice Sheet. So when some of the people talk about the um, the Bering Land Bridge and coming through, so this would have melted at some point, they think, probably around the Bowling Isle Rod, that high point 14,500 years ago. Whether anybody could actually make it through it, it's questionable. Maybe it opened about 50 miles wide, but if it's melting, what's going to be in there? Floodwaters. Not to mention, you've got mastodons, giant cave bears, saber tooth cats. It's basically a prey fun. We just swam down and floated and got in the rapids. <laughs> Mexico. <laughs> so it did actually, yeah, the Rockies that did go down into Mexico glacier. So it's also we're looking at around 13,000 years ago. So it wasn't melted. This was 21,000. That was the maximum height. So it was all in the Andes was covered. Most of uh, Russia, Europe, uh, England was completely under ice as well. The Himalayas. Uh, it was also nice. So that was the last glacial maximum. Um, Remember this picture and what he's talking about when we get into creation story and we start talking about Sawiskara. Mm -hmm. Remember this. Okay, sorry. It's okay. How come we only really focus on the top? Yeah, they got the whole earth. Um, because that's usually the coldest region or the polar region because they, they're at least that. So going this and they have the sun, right? You have the equator, which is the hottest part, so that's in the center. And the poles are, are normally cold. Yeah. However, there has been interglacial times when there was no ice whatsoever on either the North or the South Pole. Mm -hmm. And there's some theories because at one point there was actually no ice in the Arctic or in Siberia, but it was all over North America. So there's some theories written by it was by Charles Papgood, whose book Pathway to the Poles, which the introduction is written by Albert Einstein. Um, where he was saying it was as if the North Pole was over Hudson Bay. And it was a different axis, axle axis. That's, that's <laughs> in theory oh, cool. with a crustal chip. Down that far. So think of it like an orange with the peel. Mm -hmm. Like the orange underneath stayed the same, but the peel moved. So that was his theory on why there would be, it would see, appear that that was the North Pole because of it was centered around there. And actually, if you throw, uh, draw like I think 30 degrees, it would be the same. Side that is the current North Pole, the, the Arctic region. Mm -hmm. So, to put that into perspective of what that type of ice looks like, here's the skyline of Montreal. That's the height of the ice. The skyline? That's the skyline of Montreal. That's Mount Royal. That would have been the height of the ice. Oh, the <laughs> There's Toronto, the end power. That was the height of the ice over Toronto. Over Chicago or Boston, because obviously it's far further south of the, the ice sheet was thinner. But so you can imagine at how this world was very different. And we're not talking millions of years ago, we're talking like 20,000 years ago. This is what it was like. And I said that the ice pretty much stayed there until the end of the Younger Dryas, down 600 years ago, is when it was pretty much. And at first, they thought the ice took uh, around that. They first thought it took 100,000 years to melt all that ice. And they realized once they got carbon dating, it was actually more like 30,000. And then they got better dating, they realized that it only melted in six to 8,000 years. So they didn't understand how could it, what kind of energy would you need to melt it that quickly? As well as during this time period, when you have all that ice because your Earth is a closed system in terms of water, we're not getting any more water, not, nothing's leaving. So the amount of water we have is there, and it's either in the oceans, the lakes, rivers, or it's locked up in glaciers. So when you had that much ice locked up in those glaciers on the glacial maximum, ocean uh, the sea levels were actually 400 feet lower than today. So this is what the Earth looked like. If you took all the ice off, that's what the Earth looked like at that point. So as you can see, there was no English Channel, there was no Baltic Sea, uh, there was no Persian Gulf. It looks like the Mediterranean was completely cut off from the ocean. You see how wide Florida is. You can see that the land bridge. Wow. And I think you can see Greenland is actually connected to North America. 
So a lot more room, a lot more things for people to, to cross over and to cross over, but as well, where do most people live? Along the oceans or at multiple um, rivers. So if there was any evidence of some form form of civilization, be it advanced or whatnot, it's most likely underwater now. Not to mention not only underwater, probably under by this time hundreds of feet of buildings. Yeah. Yeah. They found the lost cities of Atlantis and a lot of other. Uh, well, most likely. Well, I know there's plenty of theories. Randall's yeah. Randall's theory is the Azores because that's basically where Plato said it was. Mm -hmm. Hmm. And he even mentioned that there's a continent on the other side of the ocean. Yeah, and Dirk Casey as well talks about it too. Yeah, and actually, I'm hoping either next year or the year after, we're actually going to be doing an expedition to the Azores. Sign us up. Are we going? Is this the course? <laughs> <laughs> Um, that the um, it's on the Mid Atlantic, um, Mid Atlantic Ridge, mm -hmm. right there. So the Mid Atlantic Ridge is the thinnest part of the crust, and what it does is it can act like a hinge. So when you have that much ice centered here on the crust, and you have literally two miles, billions upon billions upon billions of tons of ice, it's literally pushing the land into the mantle. By hundreds of feet. And so, what that's going to do is put down on the earth, it has to respond somehow. So, this ridge line is going to go up like that. And so, you have that's above water, not to mention sea level is 400 feet lower. Then we have the melting event. All that ice is suddenly, all that weight is taken off of the continent. The continent's going to come up just like a Seat cushion, you're sitting on, you get up, the seat cushion is going to come up, mm. and then that ridge goes down, and ocean waters come up 400 feet. Mm. So that's why, and Randall Carlson, he has a lot of science and geology behind that to back that up. One thing I want us to say about, um, you know, the chart you had up with all the different, you know, and the, the, um, the gauging of the different temperatures and falling and, and rising. Anyway, I, I, what it's making me think of, you know, on a spiritual level is that the universe, that the earth itself, every 26,000 years, there's a shift. 4,920 years. <laughs> <laughs> Where you from? <laughs> no, that's procession. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it just made me think that maybe during those things with the drop, the, 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 the sudden drop or whatever, you know, maybe the shift. Well, that's why. It, maybe there was a shift the, somehow and, well, it, this, and, it, and it caused that, you know. Well, that's why you said where, where Randall yeah. had pointed this out 30, 40 years ago. He said, well, watch this date because it's half a procession ago. He said something happened. Mm -hmm. And only now is all the scientific data actually come up to show yes about the younger dryas that that happened mm -hmm. out of the session. And so that's what he was well, we don't have a real clock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the real clock yeah. is, is the not just 12 months of the year or the hour, it's the 12 months of the year, but it, as well, it's the 12 months of the great year, great year being 25,920 year. And each age or, or each month is 2160 years oh. so, that, I, so what kind of clock is that is there a specific name no it's, it's all, no it's just well it's called procession oh okay okay it's for, or procession of the equinoxes because what happens is they're going in the other direction because of, of the right from my globe so the earth wobbles yeah and it takes that wobble 920 920 years to do one cycle so basically if you're look at the stars that the whole constellation is going to move one degree every 72 years. Wow. Wow. So that, that's how, and, how and that is. Yeah. So that's why yeah. where we were talking last week how everybody's uh, zodiac sign is actually different mm -hmm. because when, when the um, Greeks came up with that system over 2000 years ago, that was during the age of Aries. Okay. Which is why and before that was the age of Taurus. 
Okay. So yeah, that's why yeah. in these old mythologies, yeah. you hear a lot about the bulls, and even Moses comes off and they're worshiping a calf, uh, idol of a calf, and he destroyed it. Because we're in the new age now, and they sacrifice a ram. Because now they've gone into the age of Aries. Then join. Yeah. So after that became the age of Pisces. Which were still, it's arguable whether they're still in there or we're going into the age of Aquarius. Oh, we're in Aquarius, we're, we're heading in Aquarius yeah. real quick. But, yeah. but that's a, yeah. that, where, when exactly are we in that age or not, it, it's very difficult to, to tell what that is. Mm -hmm. But then in the age of Pisces, that's why you know the Christians would use a fish to signal to each other. Oh, okay. that because they were in the age of Pisces. Yeah, yeah. So that's how all these processional numbers and everything and, and they're all sacred numbers 2160 it's so fascinating and it's also, it also happens to be the diameter of the moon is 2160 miles Jesus. So, see how everything i i seen a, oh sorry i seen a video too that the guy said on there if you know math or what whichever part of the math i don't know whatever if it's a specific part of the math the equation or, or the problem or whatever it's called the formula I don't, i'm not a math person <laughs> i'm a teacher but i don't like to eat math <laughs> but that is 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 where they said that all of this with the stars and all this scientific stuff it all has to do with numbers and if you know the the whatever the formulas and all that it, it, you could figure out all kind of things and i'm like it's just amazing, you know, how it how it all lines up, you know, yeah. lines up to this and that and the degree mm -hmm. and you're like, holy, and it's just that, amazing. That's why all the, um, yeah. all the processional numbers are all sacred numbers, meaning they all add up to nine, 72, 7 plus 2 is 9, 2,160, 2 plus 1 plus 60 plus 9, 144 is the sacred number, 666. Nine six plus six plus six equals eighteen. One plus eighty equals nine. And the Earth goes through space at sixty-six thousand six hundred miles per hour. Oh my God! Don't say it any faster. <laughs> <laughs> I just said I don't have my phone number. Because you have numbers like forty-three thousand two hundred, which I showed uh, in the first one, where if you take the uh, diameter or the outside dimensions of the Great Pyramid of Giza and the height, and you multiply by 43,200, which is a processional number, which is a sacred number, you get the circumference of the Earth and the height is from the equator to the North Pole. Yeah. 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 And that 43,000, well, it's actually 432, it could be any derivative there, 4,320, 43,200, 432,000 miles oh is the radius of the sun. So that's how everything kind of ties in with the sacred numbers and the second. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's just plus for me. I can see if there's ice on the poles, you're in an ice age. Okay. So, um, what does it look like? Is it a sea or graph going like this and then like this, where we're going into uh, a heating phase? Like, mm -hmm. What do they project is coming? Like most people think, oh well, with everything that's happening, I'm gonna go back to my garden. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna grow my own food. Is that something that growing, like, season, growing season is gonna be longer? It's, uh, it's not necessarily a heat wave where you're gonna no. boil to death. We've right? seen, like I said, we've seen on because the numbers look pretty high. So I'm just trying to understand the the graph. No, but it was this high. That was called the climatic optimum. Because not only do you have longer growing seasons, you also can grow longer, uh, longer further north and higher up in elevation. Ooh. So and the, the and, keeps coming. and the more CO2 you yeah. have in the atmosphere, yes. <laughs> the more CO2 plants have, because don't forget CO2 is plant food, although they try to sell, they're trying to sell it as a pollutant. No, that's plant food. If uh, CO2 levels hit 150 parts per million or below, photosynthesis stops. And, and therefore, everything stops. But that's what they're trying to do. I know, but that's what I'm saying is that at four, so making their the, I thought we've seen it going back in time. It's been as much as almost definitely 8,000 parts per million, possibly as high as 10,000 parts per million. But there's been times in the earth, I mean, that was possibly millions of years ago, but life thrived under those scenarios because the more CO2 that's in the atmosphere, plants can grow in drier places, which is why actually right now the planet is actually greening because of the additional CO2 in the atmosphere. 
So and, and being able to go in and dry places. This this spring, I had yeah. oh. there before. I couldn't believe the flowers and the and, growth. This, this and the more CO two they have, the less water plants need. So that's that's what I'm saying. It, it's trying to paint it as a bad thing, but no, there's also some benefits to it as well. So. So we'll be having gardens up north at Dover Road. Yeah. Well, but going going yeah, to the like, medieval warming, they were actually able to have vineyards in England, which since then they, they hadn't been able to from this time here, they were actually skating on the Thames River. That's how cool they got there. And now that's our normal, now they're able to grow grapes again in England. So um, that's an indication of, yes, it's been warmer than before mm. in history. And we have some, while we don't have the official record for the thermometers, we do have either proxy information such as this or other type of looking at the plants that have been fossilized to see under what kind of environment they thrive and figure out what the temperature was on that. And then based on human history, whatever has been recorded on various storms or whatever else. So, so there, there is all that as well. You know, in terms of all of this, what just came to me was like the intrinsic deep knowledge that our people have, the feeling what's coming. And for, I see a lot of people saving seeds, saving things, holding on to these things. Like we may not all know how to do it right now, but this movement that's just naturally happening within Native people is crazy. Mm -hmm. Well, it's only that. And, I'm and, not a farmer, though. <laughs> but I mean, the whole thing with the, I think you and I were talking about it, was the, the end of the world, right? When they, they talk about it in, the, in, in mythologies or whatever, if we talk about the end of the world. What they mean isn't the literal end of the world, is that under their system, how they envisioned the world was held, being held up by four pillars, and that being the, the <clears throat> constellations on the equinoxes and on the solstice. And when their world ended, that's when we had that processional change. Now we're in a new age. All the constellations have changed. So that world has ended. Now we're having a new world because of the changing of the constellation. So that's what they mean with the end of the world when they're talking about mythology. They're not talking about the literal end of the world. Yeah. So. Yeah. A lot of like, the language is like it's more symbolic, describing what's mm -hmm. going to happen. You know, it's not really exactly what's going to happen. But people take it literal. Even today, people take horoscopes literal. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like no, it doesn't work that way. You know, yeah. but yeah. So keep your bell on. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So anyway, so we had, like I said, so four hundred feet lower, and then, so that's basically went from this to that. You're welcome. And so we had four hundred feet rise, but it wasn't like. Smooth or all at once, it also came out in two big pulses melt water, oh, melt water pulse 1A and 1B. So, the timing that in fact this might have been bowling an owl rod or 14,500 years ago, or the onset of the young drive 12,900 years ago, this was definitely probably 11,600 years ago. So, basically, the rate of water, like right now, they're worried about what is it, two feet, one foot, or two feet in a century of sea level rises. Two. two feet. Okay, so this was 10 times that rate. So it was 20 feet in a century. How much? And this was 15 times considerably. So about 30 feet per century worth of water. So it wasn't like one sudden rush but it was into pulses. And that's based on the data that they got off of uh, coral reefs in the Caribbean. So once again, we were talking about how I'm sorry. Of how we managed to go from that to melt it in six to eight thousand years. Um, around 2007, scientists Firestone and uh, Wet came out with a report where they looked at the black mat that was discovered. Um, they've now discovered it all over North America, South America, out to the Middle East, and everywhere. So, this black mat what they found is from 12,000 data to 12,900 years ago. Uh, and in that black mat are, are microspherals, nano diamonds, uh, platinum group metals. And so those are usually proxies for some sort of cosmic impact. That's how it's got to determine that the last, uh, the impact of KT event that wiped out the dinosaurs was that they first found that layer dating to 65 million years ago that was uh, filled with the platinum group metals. Because the Earth's crust is very deficient in the platinum group metals because it likes iron, so most of it. You know, while the earth was forming, uh, went to the core of the earth. 
but where there's a lot of platinum group metals are in asteroids, meteors, comets, basically things from outer space. As well, within that mat was the lightest black, was it's basically full of soot. So basically, they said there's enough soot in there that it's as if literally every single tree in North America was on fire. Mm. So that was enough to put that, and that's what we see. The mammoths and all those other Clovis people are in this man below it, but not above it. So that's why we said okay, where, where they started looking at, okay, where's the evidence? It looks like we, we have this evidence that the potential comet impact from 12,900 years ago. Now, where would it be? And we've seen it. Uh, so this was Shoemaker Levy 9. Uh, in actually, 1992, Jupiter captured that comet and it basically ripped itself apart into 21 different uh, parts. And then in two years later, July 1994, it actually they impacted over several weeks into Jupiter. And some of, some of the stars that went into Jupiter is actually bigger than the Earth. So if one of those pieces had hit the Earth, who knows what would happen, but uh, Graham Hancock always says, you know, Thank you, Jupiter, for taking one for the team. <laughs> so most likely, uh, the event that that, uh, that those comets that came back that hit during the Younger Dryas, they Firestone West, and they actually have it's called the Comet Research Group. There's about 66 scientists that are part of this group now that are investigating this. They think it came from the Torrid Meteor Stream, which has crossed twice a year in July, and then once again. Uh, Right now, we're currently in toward the year stream. Um, so they think it's around this time when he would have been impacted. And that's the whole thing. Remember from a couple of weeks ago when we watched the, the video from uh, with Randall on uh, Halloween. So the evidence is growing year by year. They keep gathering more evidence that, that yes, there was potential comet impact. And that like into the would have been into the ice sheet, possibly the water, but basically the skeptics to are saying show us the crater. Although people are well, you know, could it still explode up in the atmosphere and create tremendous damage? Like basically, <clears throat> like the one that exploded over to Guska on June 30th, thinking, you know, wait, if it had exploded over a city, it would have completely annihilated the city. Or it be it's basically like a nuclear explosion going off. So it doesn't have to hit the earth to cause damage. It can explode in the atmosphere and do plenty of damage on its own. So uh, some of the potential impact sites that, we'll, that they're looking at in Scablands, in the Washington Scablands. So this is where I did the tour twice with uh, Randall Carlson in, in uh, Central, North Central Washington State. So this is the whole Scablands area. So Randall thinking right here might have been a potential impact site. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is the uh, Prince George region. And once again, the impact site, the impact is going to look different than if it actually hit the earth because it's hitting into the ice. Okay. So I know have some in Arizona too. Yeah, there, there is one in Arizona, but that's that's the data. That's that's not a lot, a lot, a lot, lot older. Uh, the one in Arizona, meteor. I forget the, the dating on that, how long how old that is. But so pretty sure it's at BC, right? Yeah. Now. Potentially because all the rivers flow out of this region. So it's almost like it got impacted with something and then it came all down. Water, uh, it looks like it faded like Missoula in this region, and then it flooded out. And there's flood waters coming down from this area, and that's the benefit of going to the Scotlands is that it doesn't because they have less pre precipitation than here, you can still see the terrain, so it's obvious in, in the terrain. And I can uh, show some of, some of those pictures. I should do that now. So this is Palouse Falls. So you see the size of people there. So it's about 400 feet. Ooh. Okay. So we're going to show here. You're going to see the falls. It's about halfway down. I'm going to pan around to the side. 
all of that that you see missing, that was basically eaten up in a mega flood. So this is 400 feet, and they estimate that the flood waters were 400 feet high. So I had another 400 feet on top of that, and that was the height of the flood waters coming through. And basically, so this was all flat 12,900 years ago. There was one piece of land right across on the crack or whatever, the flood water came through it and basically ate out this region here. Hang on, Mike. Can you show uh, the people? <gasps> oh, wow. Staring it up on here, but on mine, it's going to be pretty awesome. Wow. <laughs> is that a hole? What's that? Is that like a big crater, like a hole in the way? Because where did the rock go? Wow, look at you. I'll get her by the Yeah. No, it basically ate it. Ate it and then. Yeah. Um, anyways, I'm trying to show you where Pelus Falls is on the map, and you can see how far that gorge went and where it dug it all. It basically meets up with the Snake River. And I forgot where it is. But we have some other ones like this is Grand Coulee. And what we can tell about the Coulee is that basically the sides are straight. So, so that uh, that steamboat rock right there, and we have Dry Falls. Where is this again? Washington State. Okay. So this is Dry Falls right here, and for I have some video where I'll show you in a bit. Hopefully, it doesn't jam up. And then we have pothole cataracts, which I believe right here. You know, as well. So basically, the this used to be straight, and then it got eaten back. You can see waters there, and that's why they have these potholes. So what's a potholes created when like you have streams of water coming in when they meet, and they basically create an under underwater tornado, and it. It acts like a drill bit and goes into actually it goes into the land and drills it out. So a perfect example pothole is going to drill or don't do at the falls, at the, the falls big... and that big circular one. That's oh a my God, that's that what was... I'm thinking of just yeah. as you're saying. Yeah. So that was yeah. out. Yeah. And you can if you look on the map, you can see where the other stream of water would have come down and meet with that one to create that into the water. So so we covered that three mile. Um, um, where is um Based on there too, it's gonna to have to hide it. It's got the same thing. Yeah. 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 And if you can look to towards, I don't know what direction, they're sending where the bridges behind you and look that way, you can see the land is all kind of ripple. Okay. So you look at those features once again, but whatever is very small it can also be very large. And um, try to. And, <laughs> Yeah, but to realize that this this too was dug out of about two or three weeks. Two or three weeks. Two or three weeks. That's all it took for it to be taken out. That's because once again, the the flood water it's not water. It's water with silt, with boulders, with trees, with mastodons. It's basically <laughs> liquid cement coming through and just tearing up everything and just eating away at it. And put that tsunami, right? Yeah. yeah. They showed it on TV this morning. I'm trying to advance my. Yeah. No, yeah. that was from the flood coming off of the melting of that ice sheet. Oh, and oh, wow. so some of that coming from there, there's also the flood waters coming out of Lake Missoula. The question being, they know there was a Lake Missoula. Sometimes, some people say, well, it flooded and refilled like 90 times. To create some of that. So, how do you get ice dam to form again and then free flood and form again? Mm -hmm. And it's water and you're supposed to have ice. Yeah, yeah. So, how does that work? So, I think Randall's more on the long lines of thinking of the impact happens, it creates its flood, Lake Missoula, then the ice dam breaks and then it comes out from that direction as well. And, uh, it makes more sense anyway that way. <laughs> yeah. I just want to do one more, a couple more shots here. Just to show because the video's not working very well. So, so what kind of heat would have made it uh, melt that profoundly? Like usually when you, on a small scale picture, things melting, they 
drip a little bit at a time. How does something get so hot that these icebergs just like all of a sudden? Because it just, it's being the theory that an comet's impacting. Right. That's what he did. The comet, as it's impacting, don't forget, it's basically like some of, which I can't show you now because everything's freezing up. Some of these comet uh, meat craters we have in here, the, they figured out that the, the power, the energy released from that was equivalent to like, some of them were like 10 times all the nuclear weapons in the world at the height of the Cold War going up at once. So they shook the earth, like literally. Well, not only that, if you're, if it's a big enough, right? Like if it's like the one over Tunguska was like 150 feet, that's a city killer. We just got missed by one in July, 2019. They only saw it as it went by the earth. <laughs> And that was 450 feet. That's a state killer. Oh my goodness. So if that, is, if, if that had exploded, let's say, if that exploded over Montreal, Montreal's gone, but that city's gone. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Anything over a kilometer is a civilization engine. So, who, because, and then kind of, it doesn't matter where you are on the planet, right? That impacts into the earth, it sucks if you're on that side of the planet because it's going to create a firestorm and the, the impact. If you're on the other side, don't forget you got something massive like that punching into the earth, that's going to reverberate. 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 Thank you. <laughs> that's going to go through the earth. It's also going to create volcanoes, it's going to create tsunamis, it's going to cause create earthquakes, so it's going to create everything that's big enough to impact the earth like that. Now, especially if we're talking about the younger, driest, we're talking about multiple impacts into the ice sheet. Now, how long was that over? Was that over a day? Was that over, it was probably, possibly over years where that might have happened. So it wasn't like necessarily all at once, but it was all action and hitting into the, the ice sheet, creating with all that heat and creating the, the, the flood water. And I want to show you, but I can't hear because it's not, working <laughs> yeah i'm going to try one more time you may have to open it separately and then share yeah. there's me and david yeah. anyway, is that so, you in here yeah that's oh, us oh, okay. that's I, me I, I, david but I, I recognize you now yeah so you can see that grant will be so you can see wow. oh. so all of this as well. That was flat. And in two to three weeks, I forget how the distance, how many miles, I think it's 30 or 40 miles long, was basically dug out within a couple of weeks. So. Something like nine times bigger than Niagara, right, Kyle? Niagara yeah, dry, Falls. Yeah, Dry Falls, Dry Falls is five times, five times bigger than Niagara. Uh, five Niagara. times bigger. I think we're on top of Steamboat Rock in that picture, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 We just been explaining that. So. And, uh, yeah. So that, like the cliff behind us, it doesn't look. It looks almost like it's flat behind us, but there's like ten feet behind us. It's just that straight down. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And if the flood waters had continued for a few more days, Steamboat Rock would have been gone. They would have eroded that away as well. well I'm trying to see if there's another. <laughs> and, that's not, and then you have. Boulder erratics. So these are basically boulders and they're littered all over the field, but this oh, wow. one of the biggest ones. And it was basically dropped there by an iceberg. Oh. So basically, got that rock, that boulder is stuck inside an iceberg the size of an oil tank, a chip, meaning that big, gets stuck on the land or whatever the flood waters go and it lands there. And then as it melts, it just drops the boulder there. And they're literally like, Thousands, tens of thousands of them all over that area. You can see them on these fields where they're so large that they can't move them. Yeah, and they're, they're, I, would, I was up there last, well, when I was up there last, mm -hmm. and I went climbing the mountains. And so I, I'm climbing, and then there's a hill. So I went, I went, I went all the way to the top, to the peak. The Rotonu went, why? Or the Geniwa, the Asan, and the Gigan, and the Quarra, 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 and the
right on the top. It was, it was, yeah. It and was beat up for the ice, like you're talking well, about. Well, yeah, because you can see them all not only there, um, throughout, uh, like even the Thousand Islands, mm -hmm. I wasn't there because, um, let's see when I pull it out. Show me what um, I know. I'll stop share. Show real fast. Let's see. <laughs> okay, so here's go back. Now, here's one of my theories that I put out to Randall. He likes it. <laughs> I have to actually, I owe Randall a recon mission to go up there. I haven't, I was supposed to, and then COVID happened. Um, so actually, when my wife, she was doing her master's of urban planning, she had this program that she was doing something on in the district of Montreal and Mount Royal and everything. And she, you know, I like to look at the maps and everything. So she sent me this link and I started playing around with it. And I was going around with it. And then I was like, Something's not right here. Maxine Jean. So looks like a bear paw. Well, it looks like a common impact. What? what? Yeah. You, oh. Yeah, it's debris on this side, right? Well, if you oh, pull in, you look at Lexi. Well, it's a bear paw. <laughs> see how it's <laughs> right? It's very perfect. Perfect that. And then you can see. It goes that way. I think it hit, and then you can see that the flood waters. The flood waters would have backed up here, see how it narrows, and then it would have backfilled all this sort of area there. And then there's other areas where it would come up through here. You see, it has like a 90 degree turn at the bottom there. And then, um, so you have to look at here in this region where we're at. Excuse me. The flood water came down. Compliments to the fact. The flood water came down. And so if you go on top of Mount Royal and you look from the thing, you can see where the flood water is. Only these mountains, Mount Roman and everything, Mount Royal, only the tops of those would have been above the water. Everything else under here was would have been underwater. Lake Champlain was created by the flood waters, by the it's a coulee as well, uh, as well as uh, the Finger Lakes. So we're safe back to the road. I'm not sure. According to the issue of. Yeah, well, it looked like it might have gone up. Go to the Mohawk Valley. <laughs> See if we'll be safe. See if we'll be safe there too. What do you go with ducks? Okay, here's the Finger Lakes. So where you have the tops here, that's where the glacier was. That's as far south as it was. So that represents where the, the glacier was. Now it's either the flood waters coming potentially from Lacking John from that area coming down, or there's also potential evidence that there was a common impact into where Lake Ontario is now. So it might be at the bottom. Either way, so there would have been ice and then because there's all the flood waters, the high pressure of the ice on top of it with water flowing underneath it would have created drumlins. They're called uh, drumlins. And so we zoom. So, what do you do at the Wedro Leaks after now? <laughs> so, you can see all these drumlins you know, pointing in the direction of the water. The water is coming this way. Remember, rounded, the rounded version, that's why torpedoes underwater, oh, they're, they're rounded yeah. because that's where it's more efficient because it's not pointy. So pointy ends are so pointy that way. Is that scratches in the, in the terrain like, or like, they're like hills. peaks? Like they're, peaks. They're like okay. all these little peaks and they're created by ice and under and water under high pressure creating that. Oh, and so we see just north. Mm -hmm. So you have them all here. Oh, no. Holy smokers. 
and right there by the Finger Lake. So yeah, that end, see it all on, along the water here. And then even if you go, there's some near Kingston, not to find exactly, but even on like a thousand islands, you see where the floodwaters are coming down this way. <laughs> yeah. So that's all I'm going to cover. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's so interesting, eh? I didn't get to cover everything I wanted to, but uh, I'm going to send out the time. It's only going to go to 7.30. Uh, I'll share. So, Trina, you're going to? All right, here we go. Only get your head. Oh, it's in the water. Okay, so we'll go ahead, while they're fixing the water, oh no, it's got up, so I'm going to start then. Uh, what time is it? It's quarter to eight. I'll try to go till about um, quarter after, maybe maybe twenty after, and then and then I want us to have questions. I want us to have a uh, question and answer. Okay. But you was it what don't see us going to guard you guys saw? Okay. So here we go. Um, before I start talking about John Arthur Gibson, I just wanted to get our minds wrapped around um, the other part of why we're here, to look at creation story, to hear the language, to, to learn culture based on language, to learn culturally based language. Um, we, wanna, we wanna learn our culture, we want to relearn how it's our, 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 our genesis, our epoch, our faith story is connected to the stars, but we also want to reconnect with the story. And I was telling the girls, the ladies earlier, girls. yes, that in the past, I've, I've been asked to go to uh, talk about this story with the Creek group over at the Family and Health Wellness Center. and. Uh, when I went there, uh, a big part of what I was trying to do with them is to get them to learn the characters of the story. So the characters, or we could call them deities, we could call them gods, we could call them whatever you want to call them, but they're these, they're these great beings of our beginnings as Ugwehuwe people. And it, it for me, the, the reason why I want us to look at them and, and really study them and really get to know these characters is because when I started to learn the creation story, when I started to really dive into it and I really got to know each one of those characters and how they were connected to the overall experience of the story, it made more sense to me and it made me connect dots that I hadn't connected before. So that's what I want us to do. That's what I want us to do here. So we're gonna learn culture. We're gonna learn culturally based language based on the culture and vice versa. We're gonna look at the creation story and we're gonna, we're gonna connect it to the stars and the constellations like we've been studying for the past couple of weeks. But I also want you to learn the characters. I want you to know, or the deities, what do you want me to call them? Beings, the beings. We'll call them the yeah. beings then. Or bean squash. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the original Aboriginal. So, uh, what I'm going to ask you to do. Because uh, I don't know how, how far we're going to get into the actual creation story today. Uh, but definitely next week, I'm going to probably come with some blank papers, like drawing papers. And I'm going to give everybody these papers. And we're going to, and I, and as we start to get into the story, because right now we're going to start part one. And as we get into the story and you start to learn that the original aboriginals or <laughs> when we start to know what I want you to do is I 
want you to draw them. We got a kind of draw. So it could be stick drawings, whatever. And as we start to hear the language, because we're not, we're not gonna have any pictures. We're we're gonna start to hear it, and then we'll we'll stop and we'll talk about what it means, and then Kyle and David might jump in and say, yeah. That's connected to that constellation, or it could be connected to that constellation. And as we start to go to get into this and delve deep into the story, in our way, in our way, we used to draw things, right? Look at the condolence cane. It's all pictographs. And those were the mnemonic devices that our people use. Look at wampum belts. Mm -hmm. It's all mnemonic devices to help us to read to remember these meaningful things to us. So next week, that's what I want us to do. I'm gonna bring paper, just drawing paper. And as we start to get into the story, take maybe one paper that's gonna be that character, one paper, and then whatever you learn about them, make yourself little pictographs that's gonna remind you about who that character is and what it, what that character means to you or how you're gonna connect it. So that's my great idea. <laughs> and so that's what so that's what I also want us to do as we get into this, okay? Huh? Oh. Okay, so John Arthur Gibson, Unka not ne That's my mom. Who is that? And then John Arthur Gibson, who is he? And why is he relevant to our discussions? So John Arthur Gibson, look at the dates, it's important. He was born in 1850 and he died in 1912. So John Arthur Gibson, he, he held the title Scania Darío. He was a Seneca chief. He, and the, the Seneca clan family title that he held was Scania Darío. For those who don't, I know a bunch of you know, but does anybody not know what Skanyadario means? It means a beautiful lake. Io, the I, I, O means beautiful or good. Ganyadara is a, is a lake. Sometimes, well, Ganyadara go is the river. Ganyadara is the lake. Skanyadario, it means a beautiful lake. So John Arthur Gibson, he was uh, also he was a turtle clan. So he was Skanyadario, so Dinotawana A Seneca chief of the turtle clan family, beautiful lake. So Skanyadario is a turtle clan family title. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Oswego Wahanagerate. He was born at Grand River. He was born Oswego Nuguadi. Rotnistaha, his mother, she was a Seneca woman and her name was Hannah. So we all know that you're, you are who your mother is. So because his mother was Seneca, Wahi, he's Seneca. So she was Hannah, a turtle clan Seneca woman. That was his mother, Nene Rotnistaha. Oknerotniha, his father, he was an Onondaga chief, and he was also named John Arthur Gibson, or not Arthur, John Gibson. Tanurone, he married a woman named Mary Sky, and she was a Cayuga woman. So before I go to the next slide, what, what does this tell you about him? Zanutanyugo, think about it for a minute. All of this, he, he's, a, he's a Seneca. Chief, he's a turtle clan. He's born at, at Oswego. His mother Seneca, his father's Onondaga, and he marries a Cayuga woman. Yeah, <laughs> 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 Look, he, what does that mean? Maybe that he traveled a lot. Maybe, he, yes, he, <laughs> yes, this, this is what they said he did. He was able to travel the Confederacy quite a bit. Everywhere. Yes. Uh, he has a lot of different perspectives. Ne -e, ne -e. And he, families. And families to different nations. What he so he so he has access to multiple Rodinoshuni languages mm. and cultural competencies. 
because when you know the language of a people, you you know their their the intricacies of who they are and what kind of mind they have it's not only that he got to travel but he knew the languages of the different Haudenosaunee nations so if you have if you're competent in different languages you have this skill set and this ability to understand something and appreciate and communicate with these other nations within the confederacy in a really effective way you're able to hear things that you may not be able to hear or see. Because we know, no, no, when we speak our language, when we see the things we see, it's very vivid. And you, so imagine being able to speak various languages, what he must have been able to see when he heard these things. And I think that's. Yes. Like yeah. not mind, body, and spirit. Oh. He's seeing and he's understanding and he's feeling. And that was John Arthur Gibson. So they said also he was a noted lacrosse player. Mm -hmm. And they said that his wife actually wrote this, that in a lacrosse game, in a taxing game, she wrote it. It was in what I sent everybody a link the very first uh, while back. There's a link. And it, it all this information is in that link if you want to go check it out. So he lost his eye, and that's important too, because you know what they say, like if you can't see what happens to people who lose their their, their senses come more. Yeah, yeah. So Zama he had a greater sense of the naturalness of creation. So also, John Arthur Gibson, it said that in his early 20s, that at Oswego, when 80% of the people at Oswego had taken up the Anglican religion, John Arthur Gibson was of the 20% who were still mm. So, So it, that says something about him, mm -hmm. that in those times when it was really... When when the when the new religion and all that was really getting pushed onto the people, he stayed steadfast in our ways. And what do we always hear about people who are like that? We hear it all the time. I I know for me a lot of that. There's always those few. There's always the few people who are they stay. They have this greater about them that that's what carries these things on and we still have those people today yeah. 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 so so i'm trying to like i'm trying to introduce you to him and who he was who he is still because he's still he he was such a powerful being in who he was he's with us here right now right today we're talking about him right here, right now, and he's still helping us. Tony Orde di Rotni Gurawana. Tony Orde di Rosatsno Seraya. He was, he, his, his natural energy and natural connection to creation was so great and so powerful that still now, in 2000 and almost 23, we're still, he's still helping us. And that's part of what I want us to be aware of. Mm. So as a young man, Gibson became a sub-chief to one of the oldest Onondaga, who's, the, it said that this Onondaga chief, that he, he was, anyone, everyone know what a sub-chief is? It's the, it's the apprentice. So we, we, yeah, we have, we have the condoled chiefs, and then they always have an apprentice. And so he was a young man when he became an apprentice, to this Onondaga chief and I don't have it on here but from what I remember in when, uh, when I was compiling that creation story that I worked on this Onondaga chief's last name was Nicholas and I, I can't remember for the life of me <clears throat> where that but that's what I remember this Onondaga chief was a Nicholas the last name was Nicholas or something Nonetheless, this Onondaga chief, it says that his memory went back to the years before the dispersion of the Six Nations. 
So before they even went to Oswego, this Onondaga chief, like Oswego didn't, didn't happen yet. There was no, no uh, Joseph Brand. There wasn't all that. It didn't happen yet. Mm -hmm. And that Onondaga chief was still living in those times. And is it because of what happened with, after the Joseph Brand? Because if he's Seneca, how could he be a sub-chief or on a dog? Because the way I can I could say his father. His father was on a dog. Did you follow your mother? But in those times, and it still happens today, they'll say they borrow them. Okay. Yeah, yeah or they they they'll adopt them to help because in those times there very few people there, left, exactly right? there, there was twenty when eighty percent of the people were were gave it all up. Yeah, and they gave everything up. So there was a small group, and and we're we're still in that right now today. Mm -hmm. We're still in that. There's very small, limited numbers of people. So even now, you'll go to different councils around the Confederacy, and people are borrowed to hold to sit in those positions. Mm -hmm. And so I would imagine that's what was going on here, well, because right on. yeah, the 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 like don't forget. He wrote, like, wrote he had, he, as a young man, was very knowledgeable. And of course, they're going to want to, they're going to want to have him help them. Eh? Yeah. Not to mention the languages of the different nations. You can't find people like that anymore. It's rare. Yeah. So okay if you find one. Exactly. Yeah. And so this is who he who he was, John Arthur Gibson, and and he, he's I I just feel thankful that he still his essence is still here with us today because he's because of people like him we are still doing what we're doing. So this on a back to this Onondaga chief Nicholas Onondaga mm -hmm. chief, who is said to be one of the oldest, whose memory went back to. The years before the dispersion of six nations in the aftermath of the American Revolution. So look at the date, circa 1783. Okay, so this Onondaga chief that John Arthur Gibson is learning from, that Onondaga chief's basis of knowledge goes back beyond 1783. Okay, so that's important. Remember this date. It's very important. 1783. Does anybody have an idea why? A royal proclamation. It may be. A, that's not what I'm getting at, though. But that's a good guess. Well, because in 1774, the uh, the um, how is it called again? The treaty. The the uh, Canandaigua. Is that the one? Okay, that's not it. Though. Okay, no. get ready. <laughs> Is, Is it, it the American um, Constitution? Called? Ah, there you go. <laughs> yes. Okay. So look. So 1783. Okay. It's in that date. Look at it. 1783. That's John Arthur Gibson's knowledge base goes back to that era, 1783 and beyond. From this Onondaga chief is who he's learning everything he knows, okay? That's so important. And that's, that's so that's prior 17. Exactly, okay, yeah. watch this. So that's why he has his- That's problems. even before the, the, the J Treaty and all yes, that. Yes, John government. Gibson, this, this man knew, and it said that he was one of those who was always in search of deeper meaning. He was like that. And we all know people. I think we're all kind of like that. That's why we're here. Somebody's <laughs> digging deeper, but seeing wood and trying to go deeper and deeper, really fine. And yeah, I guess that's why I'm really into him because I that's kind of how I am to I'm always digging. I always want to know more. So John Arthur Gibson, he was known to he traced the custom or a belief back to its earliest remembered antecedents and acquired the wide knowledge and of the customs, the traditions, and religion, but we know that means mm. this is just a quote from this guy, uh, this University of Toronto guy, 
of his ancestors for which he became noted. So still, look, 2022, or this guy from University of Toronto, he, everyone is still always going to John Arthur Gibson because that's how he was. That's who he is. He was always digging deeper and his knowledge base goes back far, like real far. So now I introduced you, J. N. B. Hewitt, and he's a big player in all of this, this story we're going to look at. So who is J. N. B. Hewitt? So he's a Tuscarora. He's employed by the Bureau of American Ethnology, and he recorded Gibson's classic versions of the events of Iroquois cosmology. And in 1899, he transcribed a lot of it from Gibson in these epics in the Onondaga language. Mm. So remember that book I brought, my rare book on the first day? This is the book, this is what, that's that book. That book I brought in, this is the book, the Iroquois Cosmology. And it was all done, transcribed in 1899 by this guy, J.N.B. Hewitt, who was a Tuscarora. So what I'm trying to build here is to show that this version that we're looking at as our basis was really connected to our culture, really connected to our people. It wasn't some ethnologist or some anthropologist who went like Fenton, who I'm not a fan of, and guessed what, and said, what this doing. is my interpretation exactly. of what I think they're saying. Yeah. These are Haudenosaunee people who are doing this. Although, I mean, you're going to hear, you're, you always hear people who are the naysayers of, of James Hewitt or Gibson or whatnot, but the truth is the truth, and these are that's who these people are. So now, let's look at Handsome Lake. It's important. So Handsome Lake, i.e. the code. And I, <laughs> I wrote that on purpose. I did that on purpose, right? <laughs> Handsome Lake, <laughs> the code. <laughs> because when the first, the very first um, slide we looked at, does it sound so much different? John Arthur Gibson, Skanya Dario, Sodinuta Wana Aga, Royaner Nene Rodinyatu. Mm. He was a con he was a condole turtle clan chief of the Seneca Nation under the clan family title Beautiful Lake. Listen to that. Now listen to Handsome Lake the Code. <laughs> <laughs> you 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 see it? You feel it? You feel the difference? Mm -hmm. And this is important. So call a noise version. <laughs> Yeah, and somehow thought we Well, I think it's Jarhansa. It's Jarhansa. It is totally. Doske. When we speak in the lang in this language, when we speak in that language, what we see, what we feel, It's so different. And then the other thing to consider is that, especially here in Ghanawage. You know, the people that came to Ghanawage back in the day, they came here purposefully to, to take up the new religion. And that was their right. And I'm not trying to say that was, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to cut them down, the people who came here to do that. That's not the point. We didn't live in those times. And they did what they did because like we do what we do today. We're just trying to, do what we can do to, to be who we are. And so we didn't live in those times. They did, they came here, they did what they did for a reason. Then, then life goes on, the world keeps spinning. And, and now, and then we get to a point in our, in our history where our people, they remember, hey, we're uwe uwe. And that means something. It means something, and now let's find what does it mean. And okay, well, we know it doesn't mean the the church, or it doesn't mean religion. It means creation. It means nature, it, and there's all this kind of reawakening. And then, with the traumas we suffered as a as a result of colonization and assimilation and genocide and all those shitty words, the people react. 
because they just react. Wahi, when you have trauma, you react and you're trying to you're trying to navigate through it. So in Ghanawage, I see I I've seen and it's been my experience that when we when we associate something, when we associate something to to all of that trauma, we push hard against it. We push so hard against it. And that's just the result of, of the trauma and the reaction to it. So handsomely, the code, people in Gahnawaga especially, they associate this with trauma. And so they react to it in a similar way. And that's how, you understand what I'm saying? So it's important to understand what is Skanya Dario? What is that? And what is all of this that happened? And why do here in Ghanawage, and not just Ghanawage, but I'm from Ghanawage, so that's why I'm speaking of it. I grew up having animosity towards Handsome Lake, and I didn't even know why. All I knew is that was church. And so we weren't allowed to have it, and we were supposed to hate it and everything. But I'm the type of person, like John Officer Gibson, I don't like anyone telling me what to do. <laughs> I don't like anyone telling me what I'm supposed to think. And I always got to find out for myself. So I traveled the Confederacy, and I went to where this happened. When, when this man... In 1735, 1815, a Seneca man carrying the title Scania de Rio at Tonawanda, he becomes ill. So he this is so he uh, this is the actual Seneca man from Tonawanda before John Arthur Gibson, who carried that title. So he he gets sick, and I'm not gonna get into all the reason why he's sick, but he's sick as a dog. He's all like gonna die. And it's, he said that to have had visitors, four visitors, who came to him with messages. Okay, so he could, they come to him with messages. So these messages are known as the Code of Handsome Lake. And that's what they call Garihuyo, where they recite, they recite in ceremony for five days in a row, all of these messages that this particular Seneca man, Skanya Dario at the time, received while he was sick. They recite these messages to the people to be reminded of things. So that now, in 1799, Skanya, that guy, Skanya Dario, so he gets sick, he has these mess, these messages, these visitors, they give him messages. They say that he's even taken. He, he goes in all like these trans-like states or home or whatever you want to call it, but he's like in maybe in this state where he's not conscious and they take him to different realms and they show him things of the past, present, and future. So you could just, you could hear it. They still recite it. They just recited it for the 223rd time last month. Um, so it says that he has the messages and then it doesn't, it only stays in Te Seneca territory at the Tonawandas and little, just, it doesn't really go anywhere, but then everything gets so, they, then they, it gets so crazy that the people, they're they're like, and we hear that about about Guyana de Goa too. When when the women had blood in their eyes, but it just meant that they were crying so much. You know when you cry a lot and your eyes are all red and all of that. And the, the there was no food, and the men were doing this, and the men were doing that, and it was chaos. So this chaos happened again at this in this era. And then some people got together and said, "Let's raise back up these messages." Because what these messages are saying is go back to the original ways. And so in 1799, the messages are raised up amongst the Seneca. 
So look at the day, the, the number, 1799. That's when it's raised up amongst the Seneca. So by, in, by 1800, the messages are starting to be requested at different territories, and it gets as far as Onondaga. So Onondaga is halfway for us. So I'm saying all of this because I'm trying to make you become acutely aware of the numbers. Uh, I'm gonna need um, Kyle to help me with the numbers because I can't count. <laughs> so now let's look at the numbers. <laughs> Gibson's knowledge base dates back to 1783, okay? The code <laughs> of Handsome Lake is only raised up in 1799-1800, okay, John Arthur Gibson, his Onondaga creation story is recounted in 1899. But we know that John Arthur Gibson's knowledge base goes back to 1730, the American Revolution era, before all of it happens. So is that really Handsome Lake? You know what I mean? Because here, here in a lot of places, if somebody wants to wants to default it or wants to to just the, the thing, they'll say, ah, that's handsome lake. So then that means, well, you can't look at it, then it doesn't mean anything. Because if something, if that's handsome lake, it means it's not good. It means it's not real. It means that it's baloney. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I grew up in the same uh, era as you. Yeah. From what we're told, which you didn't mention, uh, is why he was ill was because he was abusing alcohol. Really yeah. Bad. And that he had these visions when he was in a really drunken time of his life. They also say he studied with the Quakers. So he went and he studied religion. So that's where they're. So that's talk. what they tell the Ngahnawage, but that's not the truth. Okay. Because what happened, because, because <clears throat> I, like I said, I was fed all that kind of stuff too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I went, so I said, no, nope, I'm going to go to where, and I went and I, and I was, I hung out over there for like five years and, and I traveled the, in the Seneca country and, and and when you hear when you hear the recital of the messages in Seneca territory, especially Tanawanda, especially at Strawberry Time, it's really Guyana de Goa. It's really good. And all they say is they say it's to go back to all of these original things. There is no quake. There is, he he did. There was no Quaker when when he had that experience. There was no Quakers in his in his in his family experience. It, it's not, he, they say that in Gahnawage because that's what they need to say in order to be able to um, to to discredit this. And then the other thing is, yes, he was drinking a lot. And he was he was getting sick from it, but at the times when he was having message, because he didn't, it wasn't like he got drunk and then passed out and then had a uh, had a vision. That's not what happened. What happened is he did. He got sick, and then and my father uh, was died of alcoholism, and and I, I've seen it in real life. So when somebody is coming off of being, of having alcohol in them, they get really, really sick. And even if they don't drink for like a long, like he wouldn't drink for like a long time, he would, he would be sick and he didn't, he wasn't drinking. So, so that whole story that he would get loaded, pass out and have a, have a, have a vision, that, that's a lie. It's not true. Um, and, and the thing was, in, with, her, with the visions, he would, uh, he would be like sick for a long time, like unconscious for a long period of time. So you can't be unconscious and be drinking. 
so ready. You just can't do that. And then he would come out. He would like come out of it. And he would still be having messages. And he would still be um, having visits from these four beings to, to take him to places to show him past, present, and future. So that's only here in Ghanawage that they created this narrative to make whatever they associate with Handsome Lake uh, to discredit it. So yeah. So now the point of all of this was to show you that John Arthur Gibson's version that we're gonna look at in the Onondaga language. So it's in the language, it's in the language. We're not looking at some Jarhansa version that some ethnologist or some anthropologist did. We're looking at a version that was done that was recited in the Onondaga language by a man who knew the Seneca language, who knew Onondaga language, who knew Cayuga language, and even say he knew And his knowledge base predates Handsome Lake by a long time, according to the numbers, right? Yes. <laughs> we are numbers guy here. Years almost. Yeah. So, so, so this version that we're going to look at, is that really handsome Lake? No, it's got, it's, it's the, the basis of it predates handsome Lake. So that's the point of it, because in Ghanawage, I had to, I had to go through all of this, because in Ghanawage, we all know what happens when it comes to this. And so the numbers prove it. It's not. Not in, okay, I'll just keep going. Now, so value in the language, Wahi. So there's value in the language. If he knew, if John Arthur Gibson, he knew that story in how many different Rodinoshuni Unwe languages. Mm. Imagine what he sees. Imagine what he feels. Imagine what he senses. The new Zahan, Negika Gahyadu, Zahan, no Unkak. So there's value in the language, more so if that person who knows these issues and matters are of that way of mind of knowing the ways of our ancestors. <laughs> Mm -hmm. you know, like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Can you say it in <laughs> <laughs> Well, it, what she's saying is, is this. It says, Zaha, more, more so, no, no, unkak, when someone, Lari Wayonderi, he knows these issues and matters. Nene, Zini, Zini, Gwari, Ho, Dahne. The, the ways and feelings and knowings of Nene Yuki Sotogungaha of our ancestors. So there's value in the language because when you when you know these things in our language of our ancestors, what you see and know and feel is grand. It's immense. And it's beyond, it's beyond like just this. And so that's who John Arthur Gibson. And that's the, right there. And, and, and this is the reason that John Arthur Gibson's on the dog version of our creation story is so important. Because when we start to when we start to hear it and we start to feel it and know it, I want you all to feel confident in knowing that what we're gonna study is something that's that's as closest to so yeah. Our original, original yes. before white um, interpretations. Yeah, yeah, white interpretations or, or uh, you know, the way they distort yeah. things. So does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Why I needed to do this? Mm -hmm. huh? Because Yahwa is uh, like where he comes from, where, who he is, but mm -hmm. 
to meet all his family who is married to who is, you know yeah so he's like united nations yeah he's he's more than it than uh confederacy yeah yeah but yeah he's he's like he's part of the whole confederacy yeah yeah you know yeah it's that's always- important too that's how he lives mm-hmm. he didn't live in a white world i mean maybe he did you know in the 1800s or even the 17 there was a lot of colonists here mm-hmm. yeah, the squatters they, i mean squatters they, sorry sorry six nations changed. Than we do here mm-hmm. they're not still very connected to the land though in six mm-hmm. nations compared to us here yeah, well, we don't have, have any land. land. How can we connect it? Because we we got a big swamp right yeah, here. Yeah. <laughs> they would make fun of me when I go there, and I they call me a Hollywood Indian, right? Mm-hmm. Because, uh, I'm I'm screaming because there's a tick on, <laughs> right? And then they're just they just like, let them <laughs> Then they like ticks all over. <laughs> but I hear like these. What you're saying about the language too is so, so beautiful in the fact that I, I found that even going to Rati Wananera, I was learning to speak a language, but it was an English translated mm-hmm. into Ganya Beha. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, everyone tells me it's so descriptive. And you're not, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking in English. Yeah. At the quarter, mm-hmm. it's not a table, it's a place to put food. Yeah. So from here, he's teaching. From uh, on a Daga Confederacy perspective of yes. the world instead of us trying to interpret yeah. it from English. Exactly. There's no there's no grammar, linguistic, anything in what we're about to uh, dive into here. This is it's as pure as you can get. And I I I I worked on compiling this for six years. And I went, I traveled, and it, it took on a life of its own. It guided me to where I was supposed to go. And sometimes I would be compiling something, and then I would try to write it, put it together. It would go so far, and then it would stop. Then I'd have to travel, and then I'd go tra- travel. I'd have an experience, and I'd understand, and I'd come back, and I'd be able to do more. And that's what the story is. It has a life of its own. And I remember... Uh, uh, David was saying last week about these stories and I think he read there's a book he read over he likes to read over and over and he gets that same feeling and I don't remember what book he he had referred to but he I remember him describing his experience and that's what this story does for me and I'm hoping it's going to do for all of us and every time we read it or every time we speak it Every time we we are gonna work, it's gonna we're gonna learn something new. Mm-hmm. I know right now I'm about to do. We're gonna start doing this. I know I'm gonna realize something else because it happens every single time. Mm-hmm. So the last thing I want to say about this version was uh, John Mohawk. Does every and everyone hear about John Mohawk? Mm-hmm. Well, John Mohawk he didn't speak the language. He uh, but he wrote. He wrote a version of the creation story in Jarnhasa. Just at the time I had completed piling the Ungwe, compiling the Ungwehue Neha version that we're going to look at, John Mohawk published his English version. And he came over to the cultural center and he was um, doing like a wonderful book review. What do you, what, you know, when they go and they sell their books and yeah. they could sign in? Yeah. Book launch. A, yeah. Yeah. So that's what he did. He came over to the cultural center with his book. So of course I was all excited. I want to hear what he had to say. And 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 this is he came in November, and I think it was by January. He passed away. He didn't last John Mohawk. He passed away not long after that. And what I what I remember really keenly what he shared with us he said this story it's meant to be told over and over and over Mm -hmm. and he had said that there was a time there was like about a 400 year gap when our story wasn't told anymore 
And, and we and we know here in Gahnawage, I remember when I was little, my experience was the creation story started with this woman falling from the sky. That's where we learned. She fell from the sky and that's where it all started. And, and I never heard about Sky World. And don't ask questions. Yeah. <laughs> so John Arthur Gibson said that was a purposeful uh, tactic of the colonizer. Yeah. Because if we're not connected to our origin, our Genesis story, our, e our major epoch, then that's the, uh, it's a, it's a, plucking us out mm -hmm. of our that tree that's getting uprooted out of the ground that's us when we don't have access to this knowledge because this is a living story it's alive and it's meant to guide us while we're here on earth to connect us to the spiritual realm and david said something about the it's celestial but it's it, you know it's it's meant it's meant to, he said it so eloquently. I, I, of course, I'm not going to be able to repeat it, but re watch the video from last week. <laughs> but I'm like, yes, that's our story. That's that's our story too. Yeah. So that's what I, I really want. Like, I'm trying to like gear it up. I want us to be, I want our minds and our spirits and our breaths to intermingle and to start to get into that mindset where we're going to receive this in the way it's supposed to because John Mohawk said tell it keep telling it over and over and over and yeah. the last thing was that John Arthur Gibson was one of the last Royaner to be taught in the old way that's mm -hmm. what John Mohawk told us he was the one of the last ones. And what does that mean? So us in the old way, that means right now, from now all winter long, it was too cold to be out in the gardens, the hunters. And so they were inside and they would sit amongst each other and they would tell the stories. Mm -hmm. They would look up at the sky and they would share the stories. And those ones that were coming up, the sub chiefs or the clan mothers or the children, everybody really, they would hear the story. They would hear it, the sound. We know that hearing sound is really waves that we can't see. They would feel it. It would get into their mind, their body, and their spirit. It wasn't on a book. It wasn't, and they would just listen. And then they would retell it to the elders. And then the elders would say, yeah, yo yonere, yo yonere zinizi wasatrori. It's awesome. It's so good how you said it. Nekti, but you need to add it. And remember this part? And remember that part? Oh, and then they would tell, then he would tell it again. And each time that, that like, like that, infinity that ate back and forth mm -hmm. that that's how the knowledge was trans was trans transferred back and forth from the the elders to the young ones and it john arthur gibson was so this what you're saying this that is our education system yeah. today they want to put white man's education into a uh, box mm -hmm. and and it's like you can't do that. It's not gonna work. And that's why keep when doing Rhonda it, keep doing it. And that's why when Rhonda was in Radi Wana and yeah. she was learning yeah. our language in the grammar linguistic yeah. box, and she was like, that's what and that's yeah, the so result okay. of that's the result of what you're saying. The what why we're losing our language is because of that way of educating. And that's what people don't understand is that our language is a living language you need to be right in it talking and feel it yeah none of this here write this write this you know mm -hmm. you know <laughs> it's not the way to learn our language it's a living language you know yeah and, and it's pissing me off things. i'm so sorry <laughs> <laughs> it just all <laughs> <laughs> you know? when i was in there that you want to hear us program i felt like i was on a charlie brown show where you know when that the teach you yeah, have, yeah, yeah. You know, they're sitting up there talking yeah. and yeah. I couldn't understand but when I, I said well, you gotta show us so when they talked about mm -hmm. and they went like this yeah 
Yes. Now I know what you're telling me. Yeah. And that's how we teach our kids mm -hmm. by doing. Not sitting up on a panel. Yeah. And I hear wah, 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 wah. And yeah. Some words. Yes. So uh, thank goodness I learned how to read. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> on my own, but I really felt like it was a lot of wasted yeah. time. I, and I totally hear you. I agree. Um, Stephen Crashin. That's why I sent I sent I, everybody for I sent a little video link about listening. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to that, watch that, and then read the Stephen Crashin. It's called the case study for uh, comprehensible input. Uh, I'm, I'm forgetting it right now, but I sent everybody the link. Oh, okay. So Stephen Crashin is the is the godfather of grammar. He like even before Marion Mathun. He's, he's like it. He's the grammar guy, him and Steve Kaufman. And they now are saying grammar is not the way to learn a language to because grammar and linguistics, you're learning about a language. You're learning the rules. You're learning about how a language works. If, what if you want to you need you want to speak, you need to acquire language. You need to acquire language functions, which is totally different. And what they do at Radio Nirats is grammar and linguistics. And that kills the spirit of a living language. It's like putting, that, and that's what it is. But well, that's what I was saying to you when I sent you that text that morning is exactly what you're talking about now because you know some of us had the language when we were younger and it was washed away. And then when she did, and when we were with that for, it, it was like it woke up what's back here mm. because she did a living oh, I mean, go with that point. she mm. didn't do a monotone boring version of it the whole physical body was involved in it and it started waking up with like oh, those words and remember those words and I started connecting mm. and I'm like wow okay it's coming back. It's awesome. a possibility to come back. Yes. Even at my old age, I, it can come back. Yes. Because just watching, yeah. not listening to the language, watching mm -hmm. the language. Awesome. I love that. that. That's what woke everything back up from my memories when I was a kid. Because I didn't, we didn't listen to General Johnson when we were small. Mm -hmm. The whole family was, and then the four, 12 out of 12, four lost it. Mm -hmm. That's like, but those memories are there. Yeah. It's just a way of waking them up and she will come mm -hmm. up. A lot of them oh, she will back up. Awesome. Yeah. And, and see, so there's a method to all of this, <clears throat> what we're doing here. What we're doing here is taking back control of our own experience and what we want to do. Yeah. Just like what John Arthur Gibson, the kind of person he was, he always was digging deeper. And I think that's why we're all here. And Kyle and David are the same kind of people. They're they're digging and mm -hmm. digging and digging for the ancient knowledge. And, and so having them here to, to be beside us and walk beside us as we're about to get into the creation story through the sound and the rhythm of the language and the feeling. And, and of course, when I'm talking, you're, I'm like, ah, you know, like I'm going to... I'm just, when I get into this, my energy is, I can't even control it sometimes. <laughs> so, and then they'll, they'll be able then to connect us back to the stars. Mm. And that's a component that really, that it's missing. not, that it's not there, but we're, we're right now, we're doing it right now. We're, we're about to just do this. And so I just feel so excited. And what time is it? It's yeah. Can you just repeat? Okay. Eight thirty nine. I just want to hear it again. Okay. Um, like I know what you mean. I just want to hear the words you said. Some language or words, it or sounds or songs. Or it's it's uh frequencies that. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And and I'm I'm also I'm gonna I'm gonna digress a little bit here. I'm I do transcendental meditation. Okay. I practice that. And we have to do that. I use a mantra and the mantra is a sound. It's just a sound. And, and when I start to practice, do my practice, I repeat the sound and, and the sound guides me when, and, and, and that my, 
meditation practice is also like an infinity. So it goes back and forth between thoughts and all of this stuff, releasing stress. And then I go back to the mantra, which is a sound. And it really does guide me. So there's a level of, of um, understanding of sound that, that I've, I've uh, acquired as a result of my mantra. Or what am I trying to say? There's a level of consciousness or awareness and a deeper consciousness of the value of sound as a result of me practicing this meditation. So sound, when we speak the language, when we speak it, and, and there's also theory, I, I, there's also theory because I've read, I've read some research on it, that traditional languages, and, and right now out there in the world, they call it heritage language, Heritage language learners, they, they need to connect with sound and rhythm, the sound and rhythm, because sound also has this frequency, these wave frequencies that our eyes can't see, but our, but our bodies and our spirits can feel and connect to. And our language, that's what it's based on. It's it's based on what we hear, what it's based on what we see and what we hear and and those vibes and those frequencies and those rhythms that cause some feeling to all connect together. That's what Ungwehue, yeah, that's what Ungwehue Neha language is. And and if you ask any indigenous person who speaks their language, they all have that same, the same, they all say the same thing. But of course, no, because, because people studied it and Ivy League, Ivy League schools say, yeah, it's real. <laughs> no, we all believe it. No, we all believe it. Yeah, and that's, that's a lot of these things that we're, that we're talking about, you know, and a lot of it is like, it because it's been colonized, right? Mm -hmm. And only because white people, white researchers, or whoever went and looked and found the information, now it's valid. Yeah. You know, but because it came from our, our culture, our way of life, our understanding of who we are and where we come from, mm -hmm. and that we don't come from the earth. <laughs> we come from the stars. Yeah, because you know? all of creation. And, and, and this is like, but, but because we can't prove it in research, you know, your pagan beliefs are not right. Mm -hmm. When, you know what, our beliefs are more than right mm -hmm. because they align with the whole universe yeah. and every energy that comes from the Why? universe, right? Neti, <laughs> um, I had attended a meeting where I saw an older man, I don't remember his name, mm -hmm. but he held a, a wampum with the, the I didn't watch a wampum. Mm -hmm. And he said that when they used to hold it, the way they held it, it was actually upside down to the people. Mm -hmm. And he said it was, the reason it was done that way was to remind the people that our roots are up there and that we're to apply what we learned up there to the tip of the tree down here. Awesome. But man, through col colonization mm -hmm. said, <laughs> That doesn't make sense. A tree doesn't grow upside down. <laughs> it needs to be flipped. So today, we think our roots are here. Mm -hmm. We're trying to apply our roots here to our spirituality, which is the top of the mm -hmm. tree, right? the ego, awesome. the highest to the creator. So we we flipped our mentality, and I was like, "Oh my God!" But can you imagine if I I hung that flag upside down in my window? People would think that. <laughs> Okay. So there's something right because mm -hmm. we're taught that roots are down here in a tree. But he said, no, it's to remind you your roots are up there. And which is why it's so awesome to me that we're you sitting know, here today doing that. We recorded uh, at the longhouse and it's like so cool and everyone puts their phone down. Mm -hmm. The way it transcribes and records and gets captured is that image. It's like that tree. What eh? Doske. Yeah. It's a visual of what we're talking, yeah. that vibration in the sound, in the rhythm, you know? 
and and it's it's real. It's a real thing. But it's also a reflection, it's like a mirror, whatever what's taking place here. It's like it's like Doske. God, absolutely, totally, totally. Absolutely. In the creation story, they talk about there's one, I think it's the moon, he's looking down, and then there's another bird, a, a heron, he's looking up, <clears throat> and one of them says, Yagungwe, and there's like a woman coming, but they don't know. There's like, we think of it as coming from the sky and falling down, right? But we don't know, they're not sure who was actually right. It could have been from down there coming up. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. we, we don't know, and it's all about perspective. And mm -hmm. even that part of the story is about how both perspectives can be technically right and stuff. Right? That's so like, awesome. So you know that white dog, the white dog ceremony. That's what that is. It eh? it talks because when they when they do that ceremony, there's two people who do the tobacco burning, and one starts from the top. Like when I say the top, I mean like Garduhyag and Wadi, all the beings up in the sky world. And then, and he comes and, and that tobacco burning gets done and he comes down this way. And then when, and then the other guy starts from the, from the earth and they meet in the middle. And that's what, yeah, there's so many connections for us to the stars to remind us about that, that we need to remember those connections but we don't right we're well we are though look at us today <laughs> uh, there's just a woman falling from the star but we uh from the sky but we forget well what was where was she falling from mm -hmm. and what is it like up there and you know how know. did she fall and some say she was pushed some say something else but mm -hmm. it's very vague yeah and so i think us being here right now i i feel like i feel like we're taking first. back we're taking back <laughs> control of our of our of our identity of our being of our story and 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 we're not of that mind anymore and we have a knowing that's why we're here that's what i feel that's what i think if you didn't have that knowing you wouldn't have come so and and then we're going to keep talking to our families and we're going to grow this knowledge not to mention to add what David and Kyle is helping us to reconnect and we're growing it. We're growing it and we're growing it. And I feel so awesome about that. Okay, so anywhere, anything else before I'm gonna do the next slide? Okay, here we go. Okay, the Jodo Mutasawe. Dini Hodiri Hodane Radi Rukya Gehrono. The ways of they who dwell in the sky. I like that better than the creation story. Okay. See, Jodo Hunzadasawe. It means when the earth began, when the earth began, Zini Hodiri Hoda, the ways, but it, it means the ways in the way they think, the way they feel, the way they act, the way they, everything of they who dwell in the sky. So who's they? Well, he does like right away. Do we think people? <laughs> you know, no. what is like? What is what is David is saying? Like the, when we say look in the sky, and even when we say and we talk about the stars, we say uh they say they are our 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 relatives the stars that's what it says it literally says when you look up to the sky and you see those stars they are our relatives that's what it says we're related to them our families they who dwell in the sky, it doesn't mean angels. It means the ones who are who dwell in the sky. So when you look up in the sky, who dwells there? Stars. So isn't that different? Isn't that a different way to think of it? Not think of it, but to know it. And this is part one. That's part one. Okay. What 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 I 
you know, what I'm thinking too is that the whole, um, I guess, say, let's go by the by the 500 year colonization thing, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, that the whole understanding of what we're hearing, you know, it's like in this English language too now, you know, it all, all over time, it's been distorted with different perspectives, different ideas, and it's been distorted with the idea that our story is just a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. So over time, even our own people have become, oh, a woman fell from the sky? Yeah, really, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, you, you get that too from people, right? So it's like, even that form of it, you know, to the, the way they make it sound like that, it's so unbelievable. Mm -hmm. But what we have to remember is that it's a lot of this language that was comes into what it is today was all symbolic and it was all very spiritual mm -hmm. because it's a spiritual thing that happened mm -hmm. you know a woman didn't actually fall and the birds caught her you know this is all symbolic of spirit yeah the energy of the mm -hmm. female energy mm -hmm. she came down but when she came down there was water and there was earth already so how did she create the earth? The earth was already here. There was a lot of water, but there was earth because they went down and they got the dirt for her and they gave it to her. This is what we're told, right? And this is how we're supposed to believe that. But in, if you think about energy and how does that work, right? Thoughts, thoughts, and you. you know, it, that energy, the power of that energy of this female energy that came here and and did what she did mm -hmm. but the earth itself was already here mm -hmm. because she didn't just fall and there was nothing we even say it oh, there was water and everything right and water animals mm -hmm. birds Unquote, the meaning of the male and the female and the things in their life mm -hmm. yeah and and also when you look at other cultures there's more than one world before this earth was even here mm -hmm. You know, so we've we've come from long, 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 like you were saying. You know, we yeah. weren't just the Haudenosaunee people. We come from way, 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 way back wow. generations. Yeah. You know. Next one. The characters, the deities, <laughs> the or, original aboriginals. <laughs> What else do we call them? Indigenous, Indigenous creatures. <laughs> Whatever Jonasa word you want to use, go ahead. It means yeah. the beings, the okay. celestial beings. Not, I love it. Not corn beans and squash. No. <laughs> so, this story we're about to go into, two, well, I have two bullets here, but there's but so look, the sharing, it's meant to walk. So for, for me, one, it's to provide you with a language-based knowledge that will connect you to our original story, to your original story. So you could gain an understanding and a renewed awareness of your identity as an ungwe ungwe. ungwe. My uncle's always saying, what are they going to do it doesn't mean in the end. You say, uwe, uwe. He's always yelling, uwe. What does that mean? He says, uwe. He says that it means it's something that's for that's forever. It's always like the vibe, right? Like the, like, like the energy. Like when we speak and there's this energy, like the infinity. Uwe. It's always going. It's always there. Uwe. Ungwe, ungwe. He means it's this, it's this original, real, authentic being that's intertwined and connected with the forever way of existing. Doesn't that blow your mind? <laughs> that's so much different. That's so much different. And you know, I'll, it's life. It is. And I'm going to the energy of God. Yes. In motion. And, and you know, I, it blows my mind because, um, you know, because I'm, I love to word right? Everybody knows. <laughs> I'm always on the horse and I'm always in the bush. 
And I'm telling you, when I go out there into the bush and I'm out there in the middle of the bush and I'm like by myself and I'm just walking around and I'm like the trees and the air and the, the sounds and the birds and this, it's like I disappear and I'm just there and I'm a part of it all. And I breathe differently and I feel differently. And, and, I, and I, that's what he means when he says, it means being a being that's connected to everything that is in creation that's just forever. And I know what it means because when I go out into the bush, that's what I get. That's what happens to me. Mm -hmm. And Wahyanoro, and I hope she's still here. She always tells me, because sometimes I go into the bush and I, I get like, oh, and these like things happen. And she says, because when you go into nature and you're connect and you're out into nature and you're and you just release all of this kind of and you're just in nature and you're open to it and you feel it, then that's why then things flow. And that's what Ukwehue means. That's what it is to be an Ukwehue. So this whole exercise that we're doing, trying to reconnect ourselves to the stars, reconnect ourselves to hearing and feeling the vibe and the vibration of the language that's connected to our culture, to the, to the story. I'm hoping and I wish that you get some sort of a renewed sense of your Ukwehue being. So... I, it sounds like this, but I'm see, I told you I get I get like this. I, I can't even control it sometimes. So that's what I want. That's what I wish. Okay. Uh, it, it, does that apply to all humans? Yes. Because I see the Honda Garden Deco books. They'll say, uh, you know, get to know, get to know what I'm and they'll show just natives. Mm -hmm. And then I see one. But when we look at it, 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 it doesn't necessarily just mean Native people, or is it any person out there that ha is connected to her when you yes. say this word? Because mm -hmm. we, we're I we have, a lot more open in I, yeah, than yeah, what we are today. Yeah, 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 and it's not fault eh? no we, we it's not our fault and and i i used to i used to be like that not my fault but when i realized i was like that and i realized that that i could i could allow myself to be it, it was a game changer you know because it doesn't matter what anybody else says or does. I'm telling you, when I go out into the bush and I'm out there in the in the woods and I'm in creation, I just feel it and I just know it in a way that I can't even describe in words. And that's what ungwehue it means to be ungwehue. And 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 we and we're all here just trying to do our best to 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 reclaim it to maintain it, to be it in a world that is meant to squash it. And all we can do is just always, every day you try as best as you can to live in the way of the natural ways of being. It, that's kind of what it means, eh? Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Okay, so I know I'm getting I, I told you are you ready for me? Yeah, I'm like okay. Love it. Love it. So now the next one is to allow you to become familiar with the key characters of this epic. It's important to be able to differentiate between these characters, the beings, the original abs, all, all of that, and to describe their significance to the overall experience of the story. Because and I said this in the beginning, when I first started to really go deep into this story, and I started to realize, oh, this character is really this character, and, and this is what it means in terms of the story, it really connected it in ways that it didn't connect before. And so that's what I want us to do. And next week when we come back, when I, when, whenever I start to do the story, and I'm going to bring everybody blank sheets, like those portrait sheets. And if you want to bring your own, bring pencil crayons. Yeah, I would. What I want, I, to, I want everybody to to Channel. feel. Yes, exactly. Thank you. And then this will be something that you could take, you could use to go back and tell the story to your family. And when, because you're listening to it, you're vibing it. I'm not gonna put pictures up. You're not. You're not gonna see words. I'm gonna have my book, and I'm gonna just go for it. <laughs> and I'm and I'm gonna be all like this. That's what I'm gonna do. Because hey, Nessa Oyera, our culture. We didn't have books. We didn't have paper. Da, 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 da. We wrote in caves, right? Mm -hmm. And no one <laughs> read. All of that. Yeah, yeah. We wrote every, but but we didn't have books to sit and yeah. we told stories orally. You know, and the whole thing about what they talk about, oh, like now they they they'll they look at our stories as myths or legends. Oh, it's a legend, it's a myth. That's not what that is. Those stories and why we sat winter after winter after winter and told these stories is because that's our history. That's our history where we come from. That's our culture, how we live. And everything that we had to learn from creation story is to tell you and you and you and him and me and everyone else that was sitting there that this is who you are and don't forget who you are and where you come from. Yeah, and continuously right? pass that on. Okay, so right? it's, a, it's already nine o'clock. Oh, okay, look, it's already nine, but just quickly here. These are the main characters. Radet Zerujes. This is in part one. This is in part one. As a downfended girl to puberty. As a downfended boy to puberty. These are the main ones here. Um, I'll put this... I'll, well... Because look, because next week, listen, I really, these characters, I want you to have a paper. Okay. This character, paper's going to be in the Desarujas, and you're going to draw whatever you're going to draw about the Desarujas, and, and so on and so forth. Okay, what a second. Now, I call them tertiary characters because they either come in and out of the story just like once or twice, but these are characters in part one. Uh, this is the and there was a reason I there was some stuff I wanted to talk about about here. I was gonna ask you, who do you see in this list? Basically, I'm going, I'm going fast here. These, but these are characters that are in part one, the sky world section. So there's so that I wanted to jog your memory somehow or or make you contemplate this. Okay. Uh, all these characters that we give thanks for all true uh they're actually all in the sky we're in the sky society section okay but that was just real fast so da 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 and i think that was it okay um so next week but these are the main ones here i want you to, we're gonna look at 
I, you could draw really, you're gonna do whatever you wanna do on your papers. And then um, I'm shutting this off and here, and what we're gonna do before we stop is this, okay? All right, the creation story, it starts, okay, cause we're gonna, I'm gonna do this and we're, and we're gonna, we're gonna go home. Ohondo dinore si ohundizu. Ya wit the wana tadi nagelekwe izi na garunyadi. So if you look at the poster that we gave out, it said it right across the top. The poster you never got. It's what it said. Do not listen. Ohondo dinore si ohundizu. Before the earth, the earth was, was, yeah, before it was made, before it was created. Before it was finished. What does that mean? A big, large group, like a group. Uh, it could it could be a family, a society, but when I hear Yahweh Dawana, it means it's like a, it was grand. It was grand, and it was a gathering. It was a grand gathering. Ohondu tinyore si ondizu before that. Yahweh Dawana tadinagerekwe. They existed. Izi not garunya. The on the other side of the blue. That's how the creation story starts. And that is the star people. <laughs> and that's what <laughs> Right? That is how it starts. Right, so next week. <laughs> <laughs> Sage, I'll smudge you down after. <laughs> <laughs> or Hi, Trina. Hey, I do have some white dog stuff for you for later, for the next time. <laughs> So are you ready for us next week and to get into this and yeah do it? Yeah. Right. Yay. Great. That's great. Okay. Take care,